we have conflicts with wins, context is important. That is why Semiosis 101 is crucial. A designer-centric omnibus follows with three videos back to back to logically help creators to abduct and all within the law too. We bring hypothesis into the semiotic toolkits of designers and illustrators to help understand who they are visually communicating to, all without a ransom note cut from newspaper letters. Welcome to the fourth Semiosis 101 Omnibus edition from season two. If you have watched Semiosis 101 videos before, then you'll already know I am Dave Wood. In this Omnibus, I collect the previous three videos into one back-to-back -back edition. Season 2's semiotic theme is a semiotic Rosetta Stone. For any new viewers joining Semiosis 101, welcome. What this briefly alludes to is the unlocking of Charles Sanders Peirce's semiotic theory of semiosis, sign action for designers and illustrators. Why? Peirce was a philosopher, a radical thinker, and his semiotic theory is applicable to enhance the designers and illustrators' visual communication abilities. But his writing is very obtuse. Hence the need for these Semiosis 101 videos. In this fourth omnibus, we will be focusing on abduction. Yes, that is correct. Abduction. No, not kidnapping. Abduction. Abducted reasoning. The logic of design. You know. A working hypothesis. In the videos in this omnibus, we will focus on how applying one form of logic can help you gain insights from your target audience's lived experiences to begin semiotically and code effectively during your ideation. But first, we have a semiotic book review. So subscribe and let's jump straight in. The two books I will be reviewing are Charles S. Pierce's Philosophy of Science, Essays in Comparative Semiotics by Gerard Deladal and Design for Dasein, Understanding the Design of Experiences. Deladal is a respected Pearson academic who writes about Pierce's theory so that non-academics can understand. This book is a collection of Deladal's essays and as before the index will be a creator's friend. I first heard Thomas Vent present Design for Dasein at Interaction 14 conference in Amsterdam in 2014. This was a 20 to 30 minute talk after which I introduced myself. I myself was at Interaction 14 to run my first PhD methodology workshop with delegates. I was trialling the first iteration of my method cards that synthesised Pierce's semiosis with a hermeneutic phenomenological framework to visually explore audience experiences. At this workshop, I had prepared sets of method cards and with about 30 international design delegates, we spent the morning going step by step through a visualising method I called a VPM, a visual phenomenological methodology. Okay, I'm not gonna spend any more time on this. If you want to know more, then check out some of my academic papers on the academia.edu link below, or my actual PhD. Now, back to Vent. I have the memory of the main auditorium fairly full, but only about maybe six of us who really got what Vent was saying about that sign and designing. In a similar way, in my workshop the day before, I had spent most of the workshop in, in great discussions with delegates about Pierce's theory. Without Interaction 14, Semiosis 101 would probably not exist. This book is a very useful reader into Pierce's thinking on semiotics. Deladal's essays stretch over 50 years of his erudition. As of all his essays, I found the first three parts of his book the most rewarding, especially part two's essays. Signs, semiosis and representament, and sign, the concept and its use. Deladal is a respected Persian. It was essentially from him that I began to use representation from a visual communication context as a suitable designer-centric term for Pierce's representament. At the bottom of the first page of his semiosis and representament essay, Deladal makes a statement about Pierce and representation, which appears to run counter to how I use the term. Deladal states, Pierce himself explicitly makes the distinction in the context of representation where sign is given as a synonym of representation defined as semiosis and 
as opposed to representing me. The first thing here is to say, let us not get sidetracked into a semantics argument over representation. As Semiosis 101's remit is to put Pierce into design-centric language for the 21st century, we have in previous videos already dealt with problems with words, meaning different and even conflicting things. Pierce uses sign for both sign action, semiosis, and sign object, representing it. Therefore, Pierce uses representation as a synonym for the semiotic action of a sign. Whereas I use representation as an analog for representing the concept, Pierce is sign object. Same word, different uses. In the next two videos, I will explore the semiotic representation in visual communication more fully. Deladal's essays in this book offer the lay philosopher, i.e. us, a clarity on Pierce's terminology. He uses a phrase in the same essay as previously mentioned that is very useful for those of you trying to grasp semiosis to apply it. Deladal writes, semiosis is a temporal process. It unites three universes of possibility, existence, and discourse. Sign action is built on the interrelationship of threes across time. Encoded semiotic meaning can lie dormant in a design or illustration until the audience perceives the representation for some thing. Then semiosis begins. It is in this phenomenological state of Pierce's fierceness where this happens in the audience for them to begin interpreting embedded meaning. This segues nicely into the second book review. The second book in this review has already been cited in recent videos. Thomas Bent's Design for Design approaches the design of experience from a hermeneutic phenomenological perspective. Yes, I know more philosophical terminology. Let us use being there instead, which situates the senses of people firmly as important to knowledge. Being there is essentially the translation of Heidegger's German word Dasein. So Vent in this book is arguing for creators to design for people's situated needs to aid the audience to make sense of what they see, interact with, use more fully. Designing for the target audience's situated needs helps to align the client's own needs more successfully. With this alignment of semiosis and being there, a synthesis of theoretical thinking helps the designer or illustrator to make stronger communicational connections with target audiences through visual semiotics. Although Vence is a Heideggerian rather than a Persian, he does quote Peirce and his phenomenology to make his being there arguments. The first four chapters of the book are very useful in synthesizing being there and experience design with semiosis. Vent refers to Pierce on a particular form of reasoning that is pertinent to creative thinking, abductive reasoning or abduction. Once more, we see the problem of Pierce's choice of terms. Abduction is an unfortunate term to decide upon, which immediately denotes something more criminal more than a form of reasoning. But we will work around that. There are three forms of reasoning. Deductive equals formal logic. Inductive equals logic of science. Abductive logic of hypothesis. Then quotes Peirce. The abductive suggestion comes to us like a flash. It is an act of insight, although extremely fallible insight. It is the idea of putting together what we have never before dreamed of putting together, which flashes the new suggestion before our contemplation. Then describes design thinking as abductive. He leads with design is a designerly process and design is a designerly process. He later builds on Nigel Cross's statement that abduction is the logic of design to build his case. He frames the creative ideation phase as when abductive thinking is prominent as ideation, attempts to mediate abductive thinking about what could be with what is feasible and what is desirable. What these two books offers the visual communicator trying to apply semiosis to enhance how they visually communicate with their target audience are two important things. Vent offers us a fresh way of reframing what creators do to build an experience with the target audience in order to hook and retain their attention and time to interpret. Del Del offers us a more concise way to apply Pierce's semiotic theory. 
Now between these two authors, it makes a synthesis of semiosis into visual communication design more achievable. If we consider the needs of the target audience, we are visually communicating too. When we create visual communication, Vent offers us up three being their questions to consider. What could be, what is feasible, what is desirable. We just now need to put these questions in the context of a target audience. To end this 12th season two video, we can conclude that a reframing of visually communicating within a phenomenological context will situate the target audience being there, that's I. Essentially using their state of existing in the world as inspiration for our creative ideation. What do I mean? Okay, let us return to the questions to power the semiotic sign action from the iconic level upwards. To represent and visually communicate a client's concept, what could be the resemblances and qualities that will hook attention? What visual language is feasible to do this? What aesthetic choices are desirable to hook and maintain attention? Pierce's logic of design as cross calls abductive reasoning provides creators with hypothesis. Come back next week and we will begin to explore how semiotic hypothesis or most appropriate solution helps you to succeed. In previous Semiosis 101 videos, I have outlined how Pierce's choice of terms can be problematic and confusing. Semiosis 101 is all about explaining Pierce in designer-centric terms instead to avoid confusion. But sometimes there's no way around a word. To the lay people who attempt to read Pierce to quickly get an understanding of his theories, there is an immediate disconnect from their lived experiences of what words mean. To the philosopher, when focusing on logic, the three forms of logical reasoning, deduction, induction, and yes, abduction, are clear. To the non-philosopher, abduction conjures up different mental images. Ironically, that is an example of semiotics in action. If when you read or hear abduction, your first mental image was not logic, but sacks over heads, chloroform, and notes cut from newspapers, this video is for you. Stop diving the police. Abduction is a form of reasoning. Abduction has been referred to as the logic of design by Nigel Cross. So let us quickly stop using the term abduction and from now on use the term abductive reasoning instead. In fact, I would prefer to use the term hypothesis instead. But first, we will explore why Cross refers to abductive reasoning as the logic of designing all within the context of using semiosis to enhance visual communication, of course. Thomas Vence, in his book on designing experience, designing for design, states that creatives use reason in different ways. Vence says that creatives use induction and deduction to understand the present state of the audience's world and use that insight to abductively create alternate futures. Logic used to understand, logic used to create. Klaus Krippendorf argues that meanings are constructed from previous experiences, expanded on them, and drift much like imagination does. During the ideation phase of creativity, a designer or illustrator will be sketching possible ways to solve the client's communicational need. We can call this ideation the what could be phase. As creatives, the what could be is not an absolute truth to deduct. The what could be is not a scientific proof to induct from the evidence. The what could be a creative devises to visually communicate to the target audience is the most appropriate solution to hook target audience attention and to semiotically retain it long enough to visually communicate to them. This what could be is reasoned abductively in the creative ideation as hypothesis for how designers or illustrators can appeal to the target audience's lived experiences. With a working hypothesis, a creative can quickly begin to seek creative solutions. With a working hypothesis, a creative can quickly begin to sketch visual ideas to represent the intended communication. With a working hypothesis, a creative can quickly begin to shape their understanding of what visual qualities and resemblances their audience will be familiar with. With a working hypothesis, a creative can be wrong. Well, as this is ideation, 
any errors are not terminal. Errors in thinking are just steps in the design process toward a visual communication solution. In ideation, creatives dare themselves to fail enough times to begin to get a sense of what will visually communicate the intended message. With a working hypothesis on the target audience's shared lived experiences, visual qualities and resemblances can be explored through what Peirce defines as, yes, abductive reasoning. Peirce sees abductive reasoning as a form of guessing or inference to the best explanation. In his collected papers, Peirce gives an example, but let us give his example some designer-centric concepts and make it about the target audience. Okay, the following example may be fatuous to some, but bear with me as we begin to unpack abductive reasoning within ideation and applying semiosis. Qualities and resemblances. Okay, a cinema-going target audience, working hypothesis. The surprising quality we observe in a cinema-going target audience is that they all enjoy being in the dark together. Abductively reasoned conclusion. We can state the experience of being in the dark together with other strangers, obviously to watch a film, is comfortable to the target audience rather than being a problem to avoid. So, if, an inference, it was true that the target audience are comfortable in the dark, the quality of darkness would be a suitable visual language starting point to begin to visually communicate with. By beginning to semiotically encode qualities of darkness through resemblances, a suitable visual language can be crafted to evoke the qualities of being in a cinema. Think of this as basic visual communication building blocks of semiotic iconic representations, utilizing dim outlines and fuzzy projected light glares, silhouettes of dark head shapes, a tiered point of view, etc. to begin to suggest that comfortable, enjoyable vibe the target audience enjoys in the real world. From that initial visual aesthetic to hook the audience's attention, then the rest of the design illustration can have a chance to maintain that attention. Once the target audience's perception is visually triggered, this is when the semiotic sign action can really begin to work on the target audience's further subconscious interpretations of the design or illustration. By framing a client's need to communicate something they need action on, by stating the visual language used to first subconsciously evoke a feeling of something familiar to a certain audience, then semiosis can enhance the visual communication further. In this example, I use a cinema going target audience, mainly because as I wrote this week's video, I was sitting in Edinburgh's Cameo Cinema Bar. What do I have in common with the other people in the bar on a sunny day? Is everyone in the bar going to sit in the dark and watch a film on the particular day? The answer is no. Some of the patrons may just be in for a coffee and a sit down out of the sun. Some of the patrons may be like me and are in the bar to have some quiet time to do something other than watch a film. But as a cinema bar, there are many people who use it who fall into the target audience of cinema goers who prefer to sit in the dark with strangers surrounding them to watch a film rather than watch Netflix at home. In previous videos, we have discussed primary, secondary and tertiary audiences. As we are discussing abductive reasoning, we are only concerned about the shared qualities of cinema goers and not cafe visitors or laptop Wi-Fi hoggers. With abductive reasoning, we can very quickly arrive at the working hypothesis that cinema goers enjoy the darkness. From this working hypothesis of enjoyable darkness, creators can begin to semiotically craft possible aesthetic decisions to appeal to the target audience. The client's brief may have nothing to do with films or going to the cinema, but the client has identified their target audience as cinema goers. Remember, this is just an example using some designer-centered context about a possible target audience. They could all instead be goat farmers or anything. It is just a working example. So whatever starting point you use to get some quick, free insights into your target audience, adductive reasoning can begin to reveal experiential qualities that can provide creators with visual clues on how to grab attention. Once perceptually grabbed, the visual language from the aesthetic choices the creative makes can be strengthened through 
sign action with iconic representations. To end this 13th season two video, we can conclude that the visual qualities and resemblance that a target primary audience will connect with can first come from a creator's free working hypothesis. Firstly, this is not simply guessing without any firm evidence. It is a legitimate logical thought exercise called abductive reasoning. Secondly, as a working hypothesis, it can change once more is known. What the hypothesis does provide the creator during ideation is a starting point to begin sketching visual communication ideas. Thirdly, from the hypothesis, visual qualities, e.g. darkness, can be visually explored as an aesthetic to hook the attention of the desired primary audience. Now, this hooking is semiotically encoded with qualities and resemblances that are familiar to the target audience. Come back next week and we'll semiotically explore this further. We have discussed audience attention a lot in this season of Semiotics 101. We have pretty much danced around how hooking and maintaining that attention can semiotically be achieved. We have examined how, within Pierce's semiotic theory, the triadic interconnection between a concept and its representation is dependent upon the interpreter. We have used a visual communication design macro analog for this in the form of the client, the creator, and their target audience. We have seen how semiotic sign action, semiosis, cannot even begin to work if the audience does not perceive the semiotic sign at all. So how do we, as visual communicators, get semiotic sign action to begin to visually hook attention? Well, in semiosis, the action cannot even begin until some thing is interpreted as something. Who interprets? A target audience does this. Who is responsible for the visual communication? Yup, the illustrator or designer. What do they visually communicate? What the client needs from the set brief? How do they do this? Obviously, within their disciplines, the visual communicators craft outcomes that, through manipulating type and image in different proportions, convey this to the audience. Pierce refers to this communicational situation as a determination flow between an object through its representament to an interpretant revealing the object. In Semiosis 101 design essential terms, on a macro level, this means a determination flow between the client's concepts through how the creator crafts the concept's representation to an interpretation by the target audience who quantitatively arrive at an understanding of the client's concepts. Simply put, Semiosis helps creators to effectively visually communicate more dynamically. Why this complexity? Surely the creator just designs and or illustrates what is in the brief and the audience just accepts it. We all know as fellow humans, life is not that simple. In a previous video, we have already explored why the by beans approach is a dead end in visual communication. Remember, in Semiosis 101, we are focused on deeper communication beyond a mere denotational level. In that deeper level of visual communication, both the creative and audience have to work harder in the communication. Why? We have already in Semiosis 101 unpacked visual noise, which Hall discusses in his excellent book. But for those of you just joining us, here is a thought experiment. Wherever you are watching this video, whatever time of day, try to think back and remember how many pieces of visual communication have you seen today. What do I mean? Think about every single thing in your lived experience today that has an image on it, has type on it, has image and type on it. This could be packaging, tins, posters, signs, newspapers, etc, etc. Can you count them all? Do you remember them all? Of course not. That is the visual noise we talk of. Too many pieces of visual communication vying for an audience's attention. How can a creative compete against that visual noise? Well, firstly, remember, we are not designing for everyone's attention. We have a primary audience the client wishes to connect with to enact an action of some kind from what a creative creates. What connects the client's communicational need with the intended target audience? That is where a working hypothesis of the audience's shared experience can provide the creative with insights on how to visually hook their attention. The basic building blocks of visual communication, whether illustration or typographic, are 
lines, shapes, colours, weights of strokes, negative and positive space, etc. These basic visual communication building blocks within Persian semiotics are potentially iconic representation. Let us think about this and how this relates to the audience and gives an insight into how to iconically encode semiotic hooks to trigger their interpretation. Last week, I used an example context of a client's target audience as cinema goers. The working hypothesis to begin ideation to trigger the audience's interest played on visually communicating darkness in a context of the visual aesthetic, evoking a familiarity to a resemblance of the quality of light in a screening. When I say darkness, I am obviously not meaning everything is visually black. That would make no sense. Iconic representation is about qualities, resemblances, familiarities to things that the audience already have experience of, even if it's only subconsciously. So in the working hypothesis example of darkness as a visual quality to manipulate, to begin to tickle the perception of the audience into taking the visual bait, the hypothesis of Dr. Reasoning is that a cinema going target audience feels comfortable with the sense of cinematic darkness. As abductive reasoning logically is not concerned with fact, which is deductive reasoning, or scientific proof, inductive reasoning, but with the best possible explanation. The hypothesis of a joint being in the dark is the starting point. From this hypothesis, creatives can visually lay the semiotic signs as bait to hook attention. From a visual language perspective, a creative can now begin to visually explore joining ideation, sketched ideas, playing around with qualities of cinematic darkness. In this exploration of iconic representation of darkness, the creative can play with colour tones, iconic, transitions from light to dark, iconic, silhouettes of dark human head seat backs, yes, iconic, etc. Why? The client's brief may not have anything to do with cinemas, just a cinema going target audience. That is true. This example of using a working hypothesis adductive reasoning to semiotically connect suitable visual language with the target audience is just a quick example to find an attention grabbing aesthetic. So by visually playing with the qualities of darkness as iconic resemblances, creators can cut through the visual noise to trigger subconscious recognition in the target audience with something they are familiar with. The trick is to trust the ideation process and a working hypothesis to help gain working insights towards a subconscious triggering of recognition of familiar qualities. As creatives, this is just your semiotic Trojan horse. It is a communicational shortcut that once attention is hooked, the sign action can then begin to work. The semiotic power is not just encode, but to interpret meaning. This meaning is by its very semiotic nature, connotatively conveyed. It is meaning that emerges from interpretation at differing levels of audience's involvement. In these videos, I have used an example of an image of a panda that is at the same time just shapes and lines, a drawing of an animal, an actual panda, and a logo. Whichever level you perceive at depends on your personal experience, cultural context, and frames of reference. If you only see shapes, the sign action has not been triggered. If you perceive the shapes as something, semiotically, the sign action has been triggered. If you perceive the shapes as an animal of some sort, iconically, the meaning has begun to work as you recognize qualities to something that is familiar. You have, in your lived experience, recognition of what is being represented is animal shaped. If you perceive the animal shape as a panda, iconically, the qualities point you to indexically make the connection to an existent thing you know. If you know what logos are, and one thing can symbolically be agreed to mean something else, then you will know that as a logo, it is no longer merely a panda. In the same way, our example of darkness works on different semiotic levels. So in this 14th season two video, we can conclude that in my example of a working hypothesis of using the quality of darkness to a cinema going target audience is a visual Trojan horse to semiotically hook attention to then communicate what needs to be visually communicated. Firstly, darkness is just a quality that can be utilized as a shortcut 
with the desired target audience. It is nothing more than a semiotically encoded visual representation to move the interpretation to the actual desired concept. Secondly, using logic in the form of inductive reasoning can have positive and free impacts on your ideation. As a working hypothesis is neither fact nor a scientific proof, it affords the creative opportunities to craft effective visual hooks. Next week, we move Semiosis 101 on to the audience. I am Dave Wood, a design educator and researcher, a published design author, and I've worked commercially as both a freelance illustrator and graphic designer. The guy behind the theory, Charles Sanders Peirce, was a philosopher, a mathematician, and a theorist. But he was not a creative. Each week on this Scout Scott Semiosis 101 YouTube channel, I will post at least one 10 minute explainer video on an aspect of Peirce's pragmatic semiotic theory. Each video will feature a take home piece of applicable semiotic theory and they do interconnect to build up your understanding of semiosis. Each free Semiosis 101 10 minute video will use designer semiotic terms instead of theoretical language. As a fellow creative and a published design author, I have a link in the description to my Scout Scott website. If you're interested in reading my Semiotic Rosetta Stone academic writing, then you can visit my academia.edu link in the description. Any other books on piercing semiotics or design I have mentioned in the videos are also listed in the description. Check them out too. On the Semiosis 101 Substack Semiotic resource, I have support materials for both free and paid subscribers. There are full annotated reading lists, video transcripts, five minute reads, plus other goodies and exclusive Semiosis 101 merchandise. The Substack link is in the description. Thanks for watching this Semiosis 101 Omnibus. Check out all the Semiosis 101 full and short videos, like and share them with your friends and hit the bell and subscribe buttons to be notified when next week's free Semiosis 101 video is published. You can also follow Semiosis 101 on the socials for updates. It is Semiosis 101 on Instagram and Twitter. See you all again next week for more Semiosis 101 to help illustrators and designers to enhance your visual communication skills.